Genoa, Genoa, Genoa. This is the T70A-B0856. 24, actually technically 26 NVMe slots plus PCIe 5 plus X16 OCP3 single socket 6 terabyte supporting Genoa system. Tyan has figured out the way to do fast network attached storage. Let's, uh, let's take a closer look. <laughs> lab use only. In the box we've got our accessory box. Accessories in this case constitutes mounting hardware and power cords. The main accessory, because tie-in takes care of you when you buy their products, is a rail. Because this review is going to go off the rails, we've got the included rail kit. And you can also keep your cool because it's got the included to you heat sink. We're gonna use that in just a moment. Look at our cute little 1600 watt power supplies. 1600 watts in this tiny little package. And there's two of them. Yes. Got our cool chassis intrusion switch. And then our front back plane. Now there's 24 NVMe and all of them have four PCI Express lanes. So that means some of our lanes from the rear are routed to the front through PCIe connectors. Nevertheless, we still have one PCI Express 5.0 by 8 slot available, as well as the full 16 lanes in our OCP3 slot. Now this is a machine that you would want to add 400 gigabit ethernet to, because this level of NVMe connectivity is really just, it's a lot. But it's even more impressive that Tyan can reasonably do this in a single socket. I mean, a single socket, 128 PCIe lanes, there's almost not enough PCIe lanes if you do the math. You get 24 bays times four lanes, that's 100 lanes by itself, almost. And then you've got two more, and then you've got your, your uh, OCPC slot and your other expansion slot, and you're, you're basically out of lanes. And while you do have the X8 slot, again, my recommendation is you, you put the, the 100 gig, 200 gig, 400 gig InfiniBand, Ethernet card, OmniPath, if you're a crazy person like me, uh, Nick, in your machine, and yeah, but even if you're running 100 gigabit, that's still only 10 gigabytes per second. You're not going to be bandwidth constrained on the I.O. side. It's going to be bandwidth constraints on the interface side, unless you just go straight PCI Express bridge. Now, obviously, if you need, you know, another PCIe slot or two, you can give up your redrivers. That's all this is. There's two 16 lane redrivers at the rear here that will drive four of your PCI Express by four connections at the front of the chassis. So if you're willing to give up, four of your NVMe, then you can recycle this slot for something else, and that'll work perfectly fine. Of course, then you'll have 20 or 22, depending on how you count, usable NVMe slots at the front of the system. Check out this nice block diagram that Tyan provides in their documentation. You've got plenty of PCIe Gen 5 connectivity for getting stuff off of the system. And that, again, speaks to how much thought Tyan has put into this platform to be able to give you the Gen 5 connectivity for off-system stuff. I mean, they know that Gen 5 storage in the market is not mature yet, and that it wouldn't make a lot of sense to try to add tons of costs to the system to support Gen 5 storage, when the balanced approach here is Gen 5 export with Gen 4 storage. And I agree with that assessment. For troubleshooting purposes, all of the cables are labeled, and it's pretty easy to see in the system how everything is connected. There's no black box you know, rear I.O. backplane or anything like that. Oh, and before I get the questions in the comments, is it PCI Express 5? No, this platform is fully qualified as PCI Express 4. It actually would have been pretty easy for them to qualify about half of the NVMe as PCI Express 5, but the unavailability of devices in the market makes that a real challenge. So I don't blame them at all for just saying that this is going to be a PCI Express 4 chassis. A single socket, this is sort of their first foray. It'll be an easy upgrade for them to upgrade this chassis to PCI Express Gen 5 when there's better Gen 5 testing hardware and testing equipment 
that's available to do that. All of the connections and the system design and everything it looks like they have perfectly set this up for Gen 5. They've also been really efficient with their use of fans and cooling layout. We'll see how it sounds in just a moment, but uh, it looks like we've got a winner on our hands here in terms of not having a screaming howler monkey of a server. Good job, Tyann, on you know designing that with uh, that sort of cooling in mind. On board, there's a stack, a literal stack of two M.2 for your boot drive or your OS drive. I love these cute little connectors on the motherboard. I really wish that this was the future of PCI Express. Wouldn't it be awesome to shove your graphics card into that instead? So the perfect choice for this build for us is gonna be the 9554. It's 64 cores, it's plenty of cores. We are actually gonna be using some processing. You see, this is a server that we're gonna use here at level one. This is not just for a review, but I picked it specifically for some unique features that it has. And it's got some stuff in it that'll let me go off label, which is great. But the thing that's not off label is the thing that, you know, this thing can deliver 400 watts to the socket. Behold Genoa, it's a thing of beauty, isn't it? So I can run my CTDP up to 400 watts. I can, I can put 128 core in here if I wanted to. Those are only for cloud providers though. Anyway, 9554, 64 cores is gonna be a good choice. The other CPU that would be a pretty good choice for this is the 32 core F series Epic. It's got all the cache and all the clock speed. It's the highest clocking Genoa, SP5 CPU that you can get, and higher clocks is usually better for storage servers. But 32 cores, when we're talking about keeping all 128 PCIe lanes saturated, I don't know, it's, it's, it's cutting it a little close. But understand that the architecture this time around, AMD really did incorporate some lessons learned, and so the 32 core CPUs actually have twice the bandwidth to the IO die as a lot of their other counterparts. Of course, in this case, the 9554, I'll just run a 9554 in the single socket system and the F series CPUs in a two socket system. If I was just gonna pick, you know, depending on this, that, or the other. I do suffer a little bit from a clock speed penalty and the fact that, you know, there's 64 cores here competing over the same power budget, but it's still an insanely fast processor. I mean, the DDR5 platform and the PCIe5 platform, even though I'm mostly using PCI Express Gen 4, all of those things really help this build tremendously. The other thing is, this is one of the first platforms that I've gone hands-on with that is two DIMMs per channel. And I bought, with my own money, three and a half thousand dollars of memory in order to be able to test two DIMMs per channel. DDR5, 4800. Uh-oh. There's somebody at tie -in sweating a little bit. Ah, uh, it's, it's probably fine. We'll know in a minute. I'm gonna wait to install the memory just a little bit longer. For now, we need to keep it cool in here. tie has gone with a heat pipe based design to keep everything cool. It's a mix of copper and aluminum. It does have our orientation sticker. It is symmetrical. And pre-installed thermal paste. Now, Genoa does support memory configurations even just down to a single DIMM. But you're a fool if you only run a single DIMM. You really want to run minimum, absolute minimum, four. But really, probably six is the new minimum. But it's a 12 memory channel platform. And there are specific rules that you should follow when you're populating less than 12 DIMMs. This is a platform that supports two DIMMs per channel. So the only thing that you really add when you add more DIMMs is more capacity. So you could, in an ideal world, it's, you're using all 12 DIMM slots. That's gonna give you the maximum amount of memory bandwidth. If you're just using this platform for storage capacity, low latency storage, but you don't need the throughput, you need the IOPS, although IOPS can bottleneck, but you need the IOPS more than you need the throughput, then you definitely want to populate all 12 memory channels, even if you're using a lower core count part. You could still get a benefit from, you know, like I say, the 32 core parts. There's a benefit from even the 96 core parts, depending on what you're doing, if you're doing any jobs or processing of any of the data. But in general, 32 or 64 cores for a single socket system with reasonably fast NVMe, basically the sweet spot. And probably eight or 12 DIMMs is the sweet spot for your memory configuration. Not really two DIMMs per channel, but two DIMMs per channel gives you that capacity. Six terabytes of memory using this, maybe have, having some spinning rust hanging off this, maybe you connect a bunch of disk shelves to this, you have a petabyte of physical rust storage, and then say 140 terabytes of, of, of NAND flash or something like that, you're caching you know, 10% of your total storage 
on flash and then you've got you know uh, two terabytes four terabytes of ram this is going to be a seriously fast system your bottleneck is always going to be your interface speed because i mean you've only got 24 pcie gen 5 lanes off of the system literally everything else is faster your memory is faster your storage is faster everything else is faster but it is nice to have that speed and pay attention to the vrm layout of this motherboard and look for this on competitor motherboards Tyan has done an excellent job with attention to detail here for the VRM engineering. It's had plenty of cooling in the front and rear. It's going to have a lot of airflow because of the ducted shroud. This is what you need for that sustained 400 watts on your Genoa platform. For a quickie power on self test, I'm not going to bother to remount a redriver card. It's not just yet because I'm going to need to install my OS drives and get some of the accoutrement from the accessories box. But this should be enough to test and make sure that all 24 of our DIMMs are detected properly. The I.O. on this platform is pretty spartan. You've got RS-232 serial, your VGA for your out-of-band management, a dedicated network for your out-of-band management. For this configuration, there is no onboard networking. Makes sense. It works good for what I've got planned for this. And there's also two 5 gigabit ports uh, at the rear and two at the front. So a total of four USB ports on this platform. Now Ty has also done another little clever detail for off-label uses, as I was mentioning before, and that's these, this sort of double expansion slot at the rear. They have an accessory you can mount here that'll give you two half height slots, or you could do your own hot swap bay. You could roll your own with something like from IC Doc. Uh, you could bring these M.2 connections out to something else with a PCIe accessory, a non tie in accessory. You could get creative using this cutout in the rear if you really wanted to, if you really wanted to build some sort of special appliance. And if you're gonna order a thousand of them, I'm sure the tie in would love to work with you on that, on that customization. Just reach out to them. But, you know, not, not a one-off, like a thousand. Well, it certainly does feel like a lot of airflow over both the processor and the memory. And it is responding to thermal events as the... <laughs> copious amount of DDR5 memory trains. I'm gonna be watching this video in my old age and say, it's like, you idiot, you spent how much memory on RAM? We need beanie weenies, what are you doing? Now, after a rather lengthy post process, it actually did post DDR5 4000, not 4800. That is again, because two dims per channel. Now, in case you're wondering what sort of a negative impact does that have on memory transfer rates or anything like that, it doesn't really negatively impact most memory workload footprints and that's because the loss in clock speed is offset by the increase in ranks you see every individual rank that's on the bus you can make busy independently of every other rank they just share the bus for transfers so even though we're running a ddr5 4000 instead of 4800 you've got twice as much memory to make busy so depending on the workload it can have a negative impact but the negative impact that it might have doesn't usually correspond to the numerical difference between 4,000 and 4,800. It just depends. That was a lot of words to say that unless you need more than three terabytes of memory, don't bother with two dims per channel. Dang, that's a lot of channels. And a lot of sticks of memory. I've just completed the first round of burn-in testing. I'm actually really excited because, okay, two dims per channel, it boots up, it's in a DDR5-4000 mode that's pretty conservative, but with the fully updated BIOS running the latest to GISA code, 4800. You can configure memory speeds up to 5600 in BIOS. Technically, AMD, you know, they have their processor specifications on the AMD webpage. 4800 is what it's designed for, but I'm happy to report that 4800 on two DIMMs per channel is at least 48 hours super torture burn-in test stable on our 9554 Epic. Tyan has done some serious engineering on this board to be able to support up to 5600 DDR5 registered error correcting memory. This is a huge accomplishment. DDR5 4800 in two DIMMs per channel configuration stable on this configuration works really well. For the memory that I used for that, I'm using M32-1 R4 GA3BB6. This is a, a Samsung assembled in Korea, Samsung in Korea. This is basically bog standard, you know, 4800B DDR5 memory from Samsung. 
ordered in, you know, a multi-pack configuration. But still, I, I've deployed a lot of these systems and I'm genuinely surprised. I need to go back and revisit some things because I wasn't expecting to be able to run DDR5 4800 two DIMMs per channel. I mean, it is all perfectly matched. All the DIMMs were from the same lot. So maybe that's a best case scenario, but I really cannot overstate the engineering that Tyan has done in order to be able to deliver this level of stability at DDR5 4800. It makes me want to try some of the, the gamer overclock memory and just see how this does at DDR5 5600, even if it's only one dim per channel. On Epic, it'll be the world record holder for Epic memory bandwidth because DDR5 5600. Good job, Tyan, on this platform. That is incredible. Kyoxia Enterprise Flash CM7, PCIe Gen 4 speeds, but consistent performance even as you fill the drives, which is unlike consumer drives. That's, that's the main difference, so check that out for storage. If you're thinking about VMware, you're a VMware shop, you do ReFS, Hyper-V clusters, it's going to be mixed workload environments. Again, if you're building a cluster of these and you don't need extreme density, you get four of these 2U rack servers, just 8U of rack space. You have tons of storage, and even though an argument could be made for a dual socket configuration for a VM host mixed workload, 64 cores and a single socket with the same 6 terabyte memory capacity, for most things that's the sweet spot of density versus capacity versus performance. And the fact that it's got so much local storage mean that you can run vSAN, and you can run vSAN with exceptional performance, especially if you've got that two or 400 gigabit storage backend. This kind of thing without a dedicated SAN appliance for storage is kind of the future because of cost. I mean, yeah, sure, everybody would love to have a, you know, a terabit flash-based storage system, but you're gonna be spending a million dollars if you want good performance anyway. Or you can do something like this and have basically local storage where the writes are synchronized off chassis. Insanely blistering fast read speeds reasonable write speeds as long as you've got at least a 200 gigabit connection for this much horsepower you know remember the minimum with vmware vsan is still 25 gigabit and that's that's pretty pedestrian it's not bad but you know if you've got a read intensive workload okay it's fine but write intensive <laughs> that memory density though all right, so the benchmarks are basically in. This is pretty much the perfect single socket server. Say that three times fast. This is the perfect single server crap. <laughs> and I don't say that lightly. You see, it's, it's a tough choice. I mean, you can really build like the perfect narrow use case server, or if you start generalizing, you start making the server a little weaker in other areas. But Tyan has really nailed it, at least for my preferences, because tracking two or three generations now, as soon as AMD burst onto the scene with 128 PCIe lanes, I was like, man, my perfect server layout would be something like this. You see, you order this chassis as a bare bone. This is, it's, it's, this, is, this is Lego. This is a Lego brick. You can use it as creatively as you want. And so if you have a Lego brick that is super customized in a bunch of different ways, then it suddenly isn't super useful when you start trying to use it creatively. And this has everything set up, this chassis, to be as generic as possible while taking full advantage of the platform. <laughs> There's no PCIe lane unused. There's no feature of AMD's platform that's really left by the wayside with this platform. You've got two dims per channel. You've got maximum power delivery. You've got a pretty good noise and airflow profile without being overbuilt. I mean, there's three fans that do all the heavy lifting. Don't run the, the case uh, the case open because it's got to pull air from the front. These three fans do that. Fan out, you've got options for a fourth fan here, depending on your configuration, if you're going to buy a bunch of these. The dual redundant power supply, 1600 watts, is great. It's neither overkill nor underkill, depending on fully loaded configuration, et cetera, et cetera. And two re-driver cards that are X16. You see, if you buy a bunch of these, and maybe you want more PCIe connectivity, and we'll talk more about what you could use that for in a second, you could pop out one or both of these and have more X16 lanes. You see, some system designers, some architects, will build more connectors into the motherboard to save on actually having a PCIe slot or using a custom riser or something like that. In this bare bones configuration, you just pop the card out. And yeah, you're gonna lose, you know, four 
of your, your NVMe, but, or eight if you remove both of them, but it frees up PCIe lanes. Now, a 20 PCIe with an X16 slot and an X8 slot, plus your X16 OCP3, I mean, that's a lot of connectivity and a lot of bandwidth. So let's talk hypotheticals. Hypothetically, what would make sense here? Because you're doing the math and you're thinking, this guy's crazy because each one of those U.2 drives in the front can do eight gigabytes per second. If we've got dual 100 gig ethernet, we're only pulling information off of this system at about 20 gigabytes per second. Like, yes, that's, that's true for 100 gig ethernet, but 400 gig ethernet is entering mainstream availability. It really isn't that expensive. Your PCIe Gen 5 X16 OCP3 slot here can easily do 35 gigabytes per second, just the raw connectivity. And you've got another X8 slot on top of that. This is pretty much the perfect configuration if you're gonna go for some dual use case where you've got both InfiniBand and regular old ethernet. You shove a regular old ethernet card in your X8 PCIe slot, and you shove an InfiniBand card in your OCP3 slot, and you've got the best of both worlds, at over 32 gigabytes of connectivity. If you are doing NVMe multi-tenant, like you're building a cluster and you're having your compute somewhere else and you're wanting to expose this as a storage device, chances are each tenant has one or a few M.2. You're not really gonna bottleneck at 35 gigabytes per second, even though technically, yes, if you do the math, three or four NVMe running full tilt could theoretically bottleneck your 35 gigabyte per second overhead. Wait, 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 you're, you're telling me that 100 gig is too slow and that 400 gig is mainstream? <laughs> We're gonna need a bigger boat. <laughs> where's my 800 gig? Come on, where's my 800 gig? I need my 800 gig like yesterday. I need my Gen 5 800 gig pronto. But if you think more broad spectrum, think like a SQL server, Microsoft SQL server. Two sockets really doesn't make a lot of sense anymore for anything that's licensed per core or per, per socket. And yes, yes, I see you. I will get to you in just a moment. For something like SQL Server, 32 cores for the most high-end system that you would ever have, to me, makes a lot of sense. Even for PostgreSQL, even when we're thinking about open source licensing, there is a little bit of an argument there when there's not a licensing cost on per socket, which we'll talk about in a second. But mostly it makes sense to go single socket and you want to go multiple systems before you go even higher in a single system and build a cluster for redundancy. Having this much fat and wide storage at the front means that your database server can do all of the lightning fast operations that it wants and then it can return the data set at a relatively slower speed over the network and so this is sized appropriately for that yes you might actually legitimately need a storage array that can clear 90 gigabytes per second 100 gigabytes per second in this configuration with its fast ddr5 memory and a motherboard that supports up to ddr5 5600 for whatever may be coming down the pipe. That use case makes perfect sense here. Again, Tyann has pulled out a win. If you need more PCIe connectivity, let's talk liquid disaggregated storage. 32 gigabytes, 35 gigabytes per second isn't enough. Okay, you drop down to 20 NVMe instead of 24 usable, because remember the other two are just for boot drive. Those are only two lanes. Although you could use those. I mean, in a multi-tenant scenario, that's gonna matter less. But, you know, again, I'm, I'm seeding ground where I may not even have to. Anyway, you give up four of your U.2 connections, you get another X16 slot. That's going to be 60 gigabytes per second of disaggregated bandwidth off of this thing. At that point, you're pretty much pegging your CPU for whatever overhead you're doing for your storage and your internal storage redundancy, plus parity calculations, plus whatever else you're on ZFS, something like that. 64 gigabytes per second per chassis. That's going to be the fastest Ceph cluster that you've ever used, period. Now, if you need to scale up, then that's when, okay, maybe it makes more sense to talk about two sockets. From a licensing perspective, it still doesn't make sense to talk about two sockets if we're talking about Microsoft SQL Server. You'd be better off with four single socket servers than you would two dual socket servers, and especially because you could just run a cluster of them, even if you have to split up your drives and you only end up with like six or eight drives per chassis. That's still gonna make a lot more sense than one or two really insanely beefy, beefy chassis for when we're talking about that kind of a workload. For open source, servers okay maybe it might make sense to have a dual socket database server but again i think generally you're better off with more systems in a clustered configuration than you are with higher density systems 
where multiple CPUs can still make sense is when you're still going for insane VM density with a, a balanced high clock speed. So you want high performance VMs versus maximum density VMs. Or if you're doing EDA or CAD type workloads where maybe you need to benefit from a vCache CPU, a lot of the time those are licensed per core, per core, per socket, and a single socket system still is gonna make a lot of sense. And so as a generic building block, because you've also got the physical room back here for something that's two half height PCIe slots wide that you could cable in, you know, you, there are cables like this, which are actually starting to enter mainstream availability. This is a PCIe Gen 5 rated cable. So you can get these now, but generally PCIe Gen 4 is the safest. Then you can use your two slots back here. For me, for our testing, we're using IC-Doc. Uh, these are the MB705M2P-B. And this is an M.2 to U.2 adapter. Now, just because you physically adapt M.2 to U.2 doesn't necessarily make the M.2 inside here actually hot plug capable. Just keep that in mind when you're doing this. This is definitely an off-label use. You don't want to use consumer drives in a server because they're not built for long-haul endurance and the you know slc right cache is like oh i've got a few gigabytes of stuff to copy eh, it doesn't really happen too much in a workstation in a server configuration the the person three offices down that's ingesting their 17 gigabyte csv file is going to make the server experience for literally everybody else in your office really bad while they're dealing with that csv file going into your database system using consumer grade uh you know storage instead you want to look at something like from keoxia like the cd7 for example which we also tested in this platform and found to be very very nice and you'll get the full pcie gen 4 bandwidth from that this is all gen 4 u.2 connectivity at the front as i said and so that's not going to be your bottleneck your bottleneck is going to be getting information off of the system but even that not really all that much of a bottleneck in fact ethernet is a bottleneck when we're talking about these kinds of speeds you want something that's a fabric really infiniband infiniband is really hard to get right now super expensive 400 gig that's that's going to make a lot of sense intel omnipath 400 gig is coming out like tomorrow and that could actually be a viable alternative to InfiniBand, if only because InfiniBand is so unavailable. Actually, 100 gig Omnipath isn't that bad. Uh, I rolled it out at my house, and I think about half the complaints about Omnipath is probably Mellanox marketing from back in the day. Of course, anybody that has InfiniBand gear, they're not throwing that away, which is why it's basically unavailable on the used and secondary markets, is because nobody ever gets rid of InfiniBand gear. So, I mean, it is that good, but you're not going to be able to buy that anyway. And so Omnipath and something like this in a 400 gig or 2x400 gig connectivity, that can make a lot of sense because then you're going to be able to pull information off of this chassis at, you know, 30 to 60 gigabytes per second. And because of the architecture of this chassis, it's dropping ready to do that, which is awesome. It doesn't paint you into a corner in any particular way. Memory capacity, storage capacity, PCIe connectivity. You want to break it out and run it to a liquid chassis? A liquid disaggregation chassis? Might have some plans for that. Yeah, it works. Very happy with this chassis. One other last quality of life improvement that I really like in this chassis is that it has physical buttons. There's actually three physical buttons for clearing the CMOS, NMI, uh, resetting the, the BMC, the remote management controller. And this is great if you've got an array of these and you've got uh, you know a helper monkey that is down in the data center and you're troubleshooting something. Like you go, you up update the BMC, it's a whole fleet of servers and one of them doesn't update and it doesn't come back. And how do you reset it? What do you deal with? A lot of modern motherboards are switching to not have a button. They don't even have a clear CMOS button or a jumper. It's literally just a solder pad that you have to stab with a screwdriver. And let me tell you, getting an inexperienced server monkey to do that is one of the most teeth grinding, hair raising, frustrating experiences ever. I don't know, they're not, they're, it's kind of a new thing. So the folks working the data center haven't really encountered that a lot. And there's no sort of positive confirmation message that stabbing the motherboard with the screwdriver has actually succeeded in shorting the pads. Fortunately, it's not something you have to do super often, but Tyann has included physical buttons. More importantly, physical buttons that you can easily get to without even taking the system apart. Look, I'm shoving my finger down in the chassis and I can get to the buttons and they're accessible and they're not on the rear panel, which I don't know that I would really love to have anyway because people love to press buttons on the rear panel, but you can get to it really easily with the top off. This was designed by somebody that has a lot of experience in the data center, obviously. 
and not just the buttons, there's also the configuration jumpers there in case you need them. Sometimes you do actually have to disable onboard VGA because of something that you're doing, especially with like the composable fabric scenario because of the, the uh, ROM bar region that your onboard VGA can, can reserve, can create some problems for something you're trying to run off chassis. And sometimes you need to disable the onboard NIC to free resources. You know, those unusual things, but, and all those jumpers are accessible here. You can even get to the socketed BMC controller ROMs if you really need to. And again, I didn't have to take the system apart. I can just get to it here. It's very nice. Overall, very happy with this chassis. Very happy with the performance. Very happy with AMD's performance here. Everybody is getting together. The orchestra is really doing some amazing things. I'm Wendell, this is Level 1. This has been a quick look at this awesome chassis from Tyann. Stay tuned for more projects with it. I'm signing out, and you can find me in the Level 1 forums. And hey, if you can think of something to show off with this other than just the I.O. latency and throughput, let me know. All right, I'm signing out, and I'll see you there. IC Dock, applied directly to the U.2 slot.